Good afternoon, everyone. Another full house today. Very good to see. Uh, I understand uh, the house is particularly full because we have some guests today, some uh, graduate students from American University uh, who are here to observe. So I would just ask that everyone, everyone be on their best behavior. <laughs> uh, before, before we get to your questions, uh, let me say a few things at the top. Uh, first, Russia has now announced the pre-baked results of its sham referenda. These results were concocted in Moscow, not collected in Ukraine. Let's be clear. The results are completely fabricated and do not reflect the will of the people of Ukraine. This is the will of Moscow not the free will of Ukraine or its people. Because we've seen this movie before, we know what will come next. We expect Russia to use these sham referenda as a false pretext to attempt to annex Ukraine's territory. But no matter what President Putin and his enablers try to claim, these areas are and will remain part of Ukraine. Ukraine has every right to continue to defend its sovereignty and its territorial integrity. The United States will never recognize Russia's attempts to annex parts of Ukraine. Quite the opposite. We will continue to work with allies and partners to bring even more pressure on Russia and the individuals and entities that are helping support its attempted land grab. You can expect additional measures from us in the coming days. At the same time, we will not be deterred from supporting Ukraine. And as my colleagues at the White House and uh, soon the Defense Department uh, will announce, we will continue to provide security assistance to Ukraine so it can defend itself and its sovereign territory for as long as it takes. Next, we are deeply concerned by the deteriorating security situation in the West Bank. This year alone, more than 100 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank and more than 30 in Gaza, while more than 20 Israelis and other civilians have been killed in terrorist attacks. We call on all parties to do everything in their power to de-escalate the situation and return to a period of calm. This is in the interest of all Israelis and Palestinians. As we have said for some time, we call on the parties themselves to contain the violence. The United States and other international partners stand ready to help, but we cannot substitute for vital actions by the parties to mitigate co conflict and to restore calm. And finally, I am pleased to announce that Secretary Blinken has designated Assistant Secretary for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs, Monica Medina, as Special Envoy for Biodiversity and Water Resources. She will take on the Special Envoy designation in addition to her current responsibilities. The months ahead are, in a, are essential for advancing efforts to confront the loss of nature and rising water and security crises, as there is a unique confluence of global events that will determine the health of the planet for generations to come. Special Envoy Medina will be uniquely positioned to coordinate an all-of-government effort to address these crises, leveraging the talents and expertise in the department as well as across the federal government. With that, Turn to your questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Ed. On your first, uh, two things on your fir your uh, very first opening uh, remarks. The uh, I, I presume from what you said that should Russia go ahead and after the referenda and annex these parts, these four parts of uh, of Ukraine, that the U.S. Uh, guidance or perhaps prohibition on Ukraine using U.S. supplied weaponry to launch attacks into those areas will not, uh, no, it, it won't apply. Is that, is that correct? So Matt, since the start of this conflict, and in fact, even before Russia's invasion of Ukraine on February 24th, we have provided our Ukrainian partners with uh, the uh, supplies, with the systems that they need to do one thing, that is to defend themselves, to defend their independence, to defend their sovereignty, to defend their territorial integrity. We have provided different systems and supplies at every stage of this conflict, uh, contouring the nature of that assistance and the specifics of it uh, to precisely the battle that our Ukrainian partners were facing at the time. It was true uh, as the Ukrainians were fighting for their capital city, Kyiv, it was true as they won that Battle of Kyiv. Uh, it was true, and it is true, as uh, the fighting has intensified in the south and the east. And now that Ukraine is mounting its 
effective uh, and heretofore successful uh, counteroffensive in the North uh, and the South as well. We've we've done the same at every step of the way. We've been very clear that uh, everything we're providing is for the defense of Ukraine's own territory, the defense of its sovereignty, the defense of uh, its independence, uh, the defense of its territorial integrity. Uh, we have been clear when it comes to certain long, longer range systems uh, with our Ukrainian partners that these systems are for use on sovereign Ukrainian territory. If and when this annexation occurs, as we expect it will, uh, these areas will remain sovereign Ukrainian territory. Okay. And, and that also applies to Crimea, right? Crimea is Ukraine, obviously. Okay, so, so then you would have no objections to the Ukrainians using your weaponry to launch strikes on Russian targets in, in Crimea either? We don't select targets for our Ukrainian uh, partners. It is up saying, to them to well, devise. You, but, you told, you've told, you, but you've told them that you don't want them to use your weaponry to launch strikes into Russia. What is Russia now? Correct. And Crimea is not Russia. I know. But, but so, I, so, I will... so why have it? So, so, so it's all on the Ukrainians that they haven't launched, used U.S. weapons to attack uh, Crimea? Uh, I think what we can say for the Ukrainians is, well, in the first instance, I will let the Ukrainians speak to their uh, military strategy. But just at a very high level, I think we've seen the effectiveness uh, of the strategy that undergirds their counteroffensive. The fact that within hours of launching it uh, in, in August, uh, they retook hundreds and uh, subsequently thousands of square miles uh, of territory that Russia had for a time at least wrested from them. Uh, their military strategy is their military strategy. The targets they select are the targets they select. Now, of course, uh, our Department of Defense uh, is a source of uh, guidance and can provide advice and counsel, uh, just as we provide advice and counsel when it comes to uh, questions of uh, foreign policy and broader questions of national security. All right. Uh, and then lastly, uh, uh, and I, your colleague at the White House just went, uh, spoke about this in depth, so I just want to ask you about on the Nord Stream um, explosions slash leaks. Uh, we saw last night that the Secretary had a conversation with the Danish uh, Foreign Minister uh, about this. H has he had any additional conversations specifically related to, to these incidents, and um, if he has, or even if he hasn't, has there been any change in your assessment of what happened? So you're right. The secretary last night did have an opportunity to speak to his Danish uh, counterpart, Foreign Minister Kofel. Uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, had an opportunity last night to speak to his Danish counterpart as well. Uh, the secretary, I would expect, uh, within the coming uh, day, potentially as soon as later today, uh, will have an opportunity to speak to other European partners regarding uh, what seem to be uh, apparent acts of sabotage uh, against the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, we have seen the statements from our Danish partners and uh, from others. We are supporting European efforts to investigate this, and we're also uh, we also stand ready to support European efforts to mitigate any potential environmental impact. Um, as you know, the energy impact of this apparent sabotage uh, is and was mitigated by the fact that neither Nord Stream 2, which of course was never operational, uh, and Nord Stream 1, uh, because the Russians had already uh, weaponized uh, Nord Stream 1 by uh, essentially turning it off, uh, neither of these pipelines were pumping gas into Europe at the time. Um, and so, of course, the impacts on uh, Europe's broader energy security and energy resilience uh, will therefore uh, be, be mitigated. Well, in the short term. In the short term. So, who, who do you suspect? Who do I, 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 I don't know, I'm the student from AU, of course. Uh, so, who, you suspect anyone? We have more questions than answers at this point, Saeed. We're not going to get ahead of the investigation. An investigation like this, owing to the nature of the investigation, underwater for one, uh, could well take time. So we're going to uh, allow the investigation uh, to play out before we uh, start to lay out uh, theories or hypotheses. But you call it apparent sabotage. You use the word apparent. Right. So what are you basing that on exactly? Just your conversations with the European counterparts or do you have other information? Then why are you not ready to go a little bit further than that? We're basing it primarily on the conversations that we've had with our European partners. They, of course, uh, are uh, 
uh, much closer uh, to uh, the site of uh, this apparent sabotage. Uh, we are, as part of our assistance to the investigation, sharing information we may have uh, on these acts, on these apparent acts of sabotage. Uh, but uh, this moniker, apparent sabotage, is based on uh, what we know, but primarily what we're hearing from uh, our European counterparts. Yes, Simon. Um, if, if it did turn out to be sabotage uh, by, by a, a nation state, do you think that could rise to the level of um, uh, NATO Article 5 uh, infringement? Uh, again, that is a hypothetical perhaps wrapped within another hypothetical, so I just wouldn't want to entertain it at this point. Uh, there is an investigation that's underway. We're prepared to support that investigation. We're prepared to support uh, the environmental mitigation efforts, the uh, efforts to mitigate the environmental impact, uh, but I just wouldn't want to weigh in before any conclusion is reached in that investigation. Alex? If this turns out to be sabotage, how vulnerable uh, the alternative pipelines are, do you think, and will the U.S. step up and help countries such as Norway, Azerbaijan, and others to boost up the security of their pipelines. And secondly, the reports that the U.S. actually did see this coming, there was some intelligence report, and the U.S. did inform Germans and others. Are you in a position to confirm or deny those reports? Of course, I'm not in a position to speak to any intelligence or any intelligence that may have been passed uh, to Germany or any other ally. What we did see coming, what uh, many countries around the world saw coming, was Russia's attempts broadly speaking, not, not speaking to uh, events of the past 24 hours, but broadly speaking to weaponize energy. Uh, and we've seen that since the earliest days of this conflict. We've seen that since uh, before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, you asked what we are prepared to do when it comes to Europe's energy security and energy resilience. Uh, well, let me just remind you of what we are already doing. We've been deeply engaged in this task again, uh, even prior to February 24th. Uh, we have worked with our European partners and European allies uh, to surge LNG supplies, uh, oftentimes in cooperation with partners on the other side of the world. Uh, countries such as uh, Japan uh, have been in a position to help us surge LNG supplies to Europe. Uh, various countries have tapped their own strategic petroleum reserves. We've done that to an unprecedented tune uh, in recent months. U.S. oil production is up by more than 500,000 barrels per day. Uh, our LNG exports, oftentimes to Europe, are up more than 20% since last year. Uh, we became the largest, this year we became the largest LNG supplier, both to the EU and to the U.K., uh, and we will become the overall largest global LNG exporter uh, this year. That is what we're doing in the short term. What we have been doing knowing, as I alluded to before, that the Russians could seek to weaponize energy as part of their aggression against uh, Ukraine. Over the longer term, because as you alluded to, or someone alluded to, and I think it was you in your, in your question, uh, this will be a longer term challenge. Uh, this is not uh, a challenge that will only be with us uh, for the coming weeks or through this winter. Uh, this will be something that we'll have to confront year after year. Uh, that is in large part why President Biden and um, President von der Leyen of the, uh, of, of the EU set up a task force earlier this year to work on uh, energy security issues. Uh, and as you know, uh, through various auspices uh, and mechanisms, we are working with partners not only in Europe but around the world uh, to lessen our dependence on Russian energy. Russia, of course, has proven itself to be a wholly unreliable energy supplier, uh, but also to lessen our dependence uh, on, uh, on uh, fossil fuels uh, as we accelerate that transition to uh, renewables, which will also be part of the answer. Yes, Courtney. Uh, has the U.S. been formally asked to assist in that investigation? And then separately, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow warned American citizens that Russia may not recognize dual nationality when it comes to mass mobilization and conscription. And I'm just wondering uh, whether you've seen evidence that this is occurring, that Americans are being conscripted or being denied consular access. So a couple points. On your first question, we, we have been in close touch uh, with our Danish partners since uh, reports of, of this uh, started to emerge. Uh, beyond the secretary, and I, I, I meant to note this earlier, beyond the secretary, senior officials in this building uh, have engaged with their Danish partners, others, uh, other uh, partners and allies uh, in the region as well. We've offered assistance for any environmental response, uh, but we haven't yet received any such 
uh, requests for assistance from our Danish partners. Uh, as I said before, we're already sharing information that is in our possession uh, regarding uh, these apparent uh, acts, of, uh, acts of sabotage, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, when it comes to your question on uh, regarding Russia, we did, our embassy in Moscow did issue a security alert uh, last night, uh, Washington time, Eastern time at least, notified U.S. citizens about Russia's mobilization of Russia's uh, citizens uh, to the armed forces in support of its invasion in Ukraine. Uh, of course, we are concerned about potential implications for dual U.S.-Russian nationals. We're not yet aware of any reports of dual U.S.-Russian nationals who have been uh, called or conscripted into service as uh, a result of this. Uh, but the security alert that you saw last night was triggered primarily by President Putin's so-called partial mobilization, the 300,000 uh, additional Russian citizens uh, who uh, President Putin is seeking to enlist in his a brutal war in uh, Ukraine. A consequence of that mobilization is, one, the possibility of conscription of dual nationals, in this case, dual U.S.-Russian nationals. But uh, as we've seen, this call for a partial mobilization has also engendered uh, protests uh, across Russia. And of course, we have a concern that uh, any Americans could be caught up uh, in such acts. They could be specifically targeted. Uh, we've previously made clear our concerns that uh, Americans have been specifically targeted because of their American nationality uh, by Russian security officials. So that, too, is a concern. But we are not yet aware of any Americans who have been arrested uh, as part of the demonstrations in response to the partial mobilization. As it, as it relates to the conscription, though, I mean, you noted the other day that Edward Snowden might now be subject to it. You haven't heard anything about him being conscripted, have you? And you would still urge him, as with other Americans, to come back home? So he, he, has, the, 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 he, has, the, he has the opportunity to stay in Russia and potentially be conscripted or come back and be put on trial, right? So we have uh, issued a uh, level four travel advisory for Russia since last August. Uh, starting in February. He wasn't a Russian citizen until just the other day. He wasn't a dual citizen until No, just of course. The other day. Uh, and I'm, I'm not talking to any specific American citizen at this okay. point. I, I may come to that. Um, uh, but uh, okay. then, of course, in February, we urged all American citizens uh, not only not to travel to Russia, but those American citizens uh, who were in Russia to uh, leave Russia. When it comes to uh, Mr. Snowden, our position on uh, him has. Uh, been consistent. It has been clear he should return to the United States where he would be afforded due process, which, by the way, is not a right he would be afforded were he to stay in Russia and to be accused of a crime there. Uh, Can I Said? Ask you sure. I want to go to where you began with the second item about the possible you know, violence erupting in, in the West Bank. And in fact, there was an interview with Ambassador Knight where he actually warned against such a thing. But I tell you, I mean, the Palestinians don't have much hope other than perhaps resort to, to, to violence. They keep hitting a brick wall. I mean, you talk about both sides, but only one side occupies the other, torments the other, and so on. Even the most modest of action you know, to, to sort of follow through on your commitment to the two-state solution, which is the reopening of the consulate that was open and so on, is not open. So what do you say to the Palestinians? That are, almost hopeless. Said, I will start where you started, because that has been a core premise of our policy, to afford a greater degree of hope, a greater degree of opportunity uh, to the Palestinian people. Uh, now, the first element of that was re-engaging with the Palestinian Authority, re-engaging with the Palestinian people, something we did uh, nearly as soon as we came into offer uh, into office, uh, reengagement, of course, is uh, only one part of that. What is perhaps more meaningful when it comes to that hope and that opportunity uh, is what we have uh, provided, what we've been in a sense, in, in a sense, able to deliver uh, to and for the Palestinian people. In addition to the more than half billion dollars the United States has provided to the Palestinian people since January of 2021, when this administration came into office. President Biden, when he was in the region in May, uh, announced an additional $316 million 
to support the Palestinian people uh, when he was in the West Bank. And last week, this department, we were uh, in a position to announce nearly $64 million additional funding for uh, UNRWA, providing health care, providing emergency relief to hundreds of thousands of potentially vulnerable uh, Palestinian children and families. Uh, together, uh, this brings total support in 2022 to uh, nearly $350 million. It brings um, our total assistance to the Palestinian people to some $680 million since April of 2021. Uh, this assistance, of course, is is not uh, a panacea. Uh, this is assistance that can help uh, to do what we talked about the other day, uh, to lay the predicate uh, for greater levels of opportunity and optimism and opportunity and hope uh, for the Palestinian people so that uh, this can be cemented and ultimately can translate into progress uh, in what is our ultimate goal, and that's a, the two-state solution, a negotiated two-state solution uh, negotiated between Israelis and Palestinians. And that's all what you did by selling the, the money, and I'm sure the Palestinians appreciate that. You know, you keep saying you want Palestinians and Israelis to enjoy the same level of dignity. I mean, they look, the Palestinians look at what you have done with, let's say, the Shirin Abakra case. I mean, you know, you have sanctioned uh, the the Iranian morality police, as you should have, because a young woman died in their custody and so on. Palestinians die in, in Israeli custody all the time. You have not spoken about, you know, I mean, you've spoken uh, about Shirin Abakla. You have not pursued any kind of independent investigation. And as far as they're concerned, this issue is dead. It's gone. So, I mean, they, you, they look at your action and they lose faith, man. Uh, Said. It is extraordinarily difficult uh, to compare cases like this, uh, and, and I can spend just a moment uh, to, ta 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 talking about the profound differences between the case, uh, between the two cases that you referenced, uh, with uh, Masa Amini in Iran, a young woman who was arrested for exercising uh, what should have been a universal right to freedom of expression, in this case, specifically the right to determine for herself her appearance, what she chose to wear. Uh, she was arrested by the so-called morality police. Within days, uh, she was dead. Of course, we uh, took uh, a firm response in the form of uh, sanctions and in the efforts we've taken to support the universal right of the Iranian people to have their voices heard. Uh, when it comes to the tragic killing of Shireen Abu Akhla, uh, we, of course, spoke out uh, within at, at the first opportunity uh, upon learning of her, uh, of her killing. Uh, we, uh, our U.S. security coordinator, worked very closely uh, with Palestinian authorities, worked very closely with the IDF, uh, and ultimately, uh, not only did the IDF, but also the U.S. security coordinator uh, came to a number of conclusions, one of which was uh, the fact that there was uh, appeared to be no intentionality uh, behind her killing. Um, so I think these cases are different on uh, for a number of, of, of reasons. Uh, we always speak out in favor of universal rights. We always speak out uh, in favor of the human rights of people uh, around the world. It's no different whether uh, that's within Israel, whether that's in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, or in Iran, for that matter. Okay. No, let's just, well, let's one. Because but Shireen Abu Akhla was a U.S. citizen. Correct. But you didn't mention that. Of course. Uh, she was a U.S. Well, citizen, yeah, of course. Well, yeah, but you didn't mention that in your little spiel there. Respond. It right. is, it, yes. But can I, can I, let, let, me, let me move around because, because we have one, many one people last thing. One last thing. Please, many, Ned. Yes, please, go ahead. Ned. You go ahead, Ned. You put out a statement condemning the missile and uh, drone attack by the Islamic Republic of Iran against the Iraqi Kurdistan. What is the U.S. government doing to protect, to help protect the region, especially given that there are U.S. forces stationed there as well? Uh, so you're right. We did put out a statement, put out a statement in my name. The National Security Advisor also uh, condemned these uh, drone and missile attacks against uh, Iraq's Kurdistan region uh, earlier today. Uh, we've made the point that we stand with uh, Iraq's leaders. Uh, it's um, 
leaders in its Kurdistan region as well as in Baghdad in condemning what was uh, a brazen assault on Iraq's own sovereignty and Iraq's own territorial uh, integrity. This is uh, unfortunately um, uh, just another instance of Iran's flagrant uh, disregard for not only the lives of their own people, but also uh, for their neighbors and for uh, what are core principles uh, at the crux of the UN Charter, sovereignty, territorial uh, integrity. This is not the first time that we have seen Iran use these tactics, ballistic missiles uh, and, and drones, uh, but we are going to continue working with our partners in the region to uh, help help them uh, defend against these types of threats. And we can do that in a number of different ways. Uh, we have levied sanctions uh, when it comes to uh, networks of uh, UAV, um, uh, when it comes to UAV networks uh, in Iran. Uh, we have um, uh, taken a number of steps with partners in the region uh, to provide them uh, with uh, supplies and assistance that they would need to defend themselves. Uh, against the types of uh, Iranian-provided weapon systems uh, that are such a destabilizing force. Uh, so we'll continue to do that. Ultimately, uh, this was an attack, uh, a, a brazen assault on the sovereignty of uh, Iraq. And the most important thing we can do in many ways uh, is to stand with Iraq's leaders, uh, Iraq's leaders in Baghdad, Baghdad Iraq's leader at, and the region leaders of Kurdistan in Erbil um, going forward. They reached out for any assistance? Uh, I'm not aware of any requests for assistance. Can I follow up on that? Uh, so um, a dual citizen or a, an American citizen was actually confirmed to be among the killed. We just confirmed that. But also the CENTCOM uh, put out a statement saying that they shot down a drone that they believe it was uh, going towards American forces. So is there any safety concerns for Americans in Kurdistan region? Uh, in the aftermath of these attacks, we did uh, a, an accountability check. Uh, in the aftermath of that, we determined that uh, there were no casualties uh, on the part of uh, American uh, officials in the region. Of course, we take uh, threats, potential threats like this, uh, very seriously. But in this case, uh, there's nothing to suggest that uh, uh, American officials were injured. So I know you guys had two statements out, but I'm just curious, what's the understanding here? Why is Kurdistan region a target of an Iranian attack? That would be a question for Tehran, not for Washington. And last question. Uh, during the Obama administration, then the early Trump administration, um, the Iranian opposition were able to engage with uh, U.S. officials. But then former Secretary Mike Pompeo put out a uh, an order to kind of refrain from engaging with the uh, Iranian opposition. Um, what is the, the position of your administration now? Do you guys engage with them? If not, why not? Uh, the Iranian opposition inside of Iran? Or here? Uh, like uh, of, of course, we're always open to listening to those who have uh, a perspective uh, when it comes to Iran and its people. Uh, I think the most important thing we can do is to listen to uh, those brave Iranians who are peacefully taking to the streets to exercise and to make clear their aspirations for greater levels uh, of democracy, of freedom, of human rights. Uh, it's important that the world not only listen, but important that the world be able to hear them. Uh, in the first place. And so that's why we've taken some of the steps we have, not only uh, in recent years, including the general license uh, that uh, was issued in 2014, but uh, so-called general license D2 that we issued late last week, whose uh, primary purpose was to allow the voice of the Iranian people to be heard by the outside world. Uh, it's an important tool, uh, and it's uh, since the issuance of this general license Last Friday, we've seen indications that U.S. technology companies have availed themselves of uh, this newfound ability to provide services to uh, the Iranian people. It is our hope that the Iranian people are in a position to take advantage um, of, these, uh, of this new technology, of these new services, not only to communicate with one another, but uh, to see to it that their voices are heard uh, around the world. Yes, in the back. Um, you said there were no U.S. officials among the uh, victims. Uh, there was one U.S. citizen. His name is Omar Mahmoudzadeh, known as Chichu. So do you have any response other than the statement you put out? 
Uh, I am not aware that we've been able to confirm that uh, just yet, but if and when we are, we'll, uh, we'll let you know. Also, I have a question about sanctions because you are talking about sanctioning the morality police. I want to ask about the pre uh, about the existing sanctions that we already have in place regarding um, specifically Iranian oil section. Uh, do you believe that these sanctions at the moment are properly executed? Because based on statistics, we know Iran boosts its own oil um, exports specifically to China. So some of the, and these are all, of course, open source estimates. Uh, and so to some extent, uh, there is always going to be a margin of error when you look at statistics like that. I think what we can say with some confidence is that some of the open source statistics have been inflated. Uh, and that is the case uh, when it comes to certain reports of Iranian oil exports to uh, the PRC. But the fact of the matter is that uh, sanctions and sanctions enforcement, it is an iterative, it requires an iterative approach. Uh, we are always looking at ways we can optimize the sanctions regimes uh, that are in place around the world. We can optimize them uh, in two important ways. One is to ensure uh, that there aren't humanitarian implications and to make sure there aren't spillover effects uh, on uh, arenas that are important to us, like humanitarian arenas, for example, but also to ensure that uh, the limitations and the restrictions that these sanctions are designed to impose are as constricting as, as possible. Uh, so even in the case of Iran in recent weeks, not only have we leveled uh, and levied, excuse me, new sanctions against Iran's uh, petrochemical uh, and um, uh, petrochemical industry, but we've taken action against sanction evasion networks precisely for the reason that you highlight. We're always in discussion, uh, not only with our interagency to determine what more we can do as a government, but also with other governments as well to make sure that we're all working together uh, to see to it that these sanctions regimes are uh, as biting as possible. Uh, yes. Uh, separate topic. Uh, Turkey has issued a diplomatic protest to the United States and Greece for deploying U.S. provided armored vehicles to the Aegean islands of non-military status under uh, existing agreements. Have you provided an official response to Turkey? Look, we would refer you to specific governments regarding any deployment of uh, their own defense equipment. That is not something for us to speak to. Uh, more broadly, and I believe I said this the other day, uh, we continue to encourage uh, our NATO allies, Turkey and Greece in this case, to work together to maintain peace and security in the region and to resolve their differences diplomatically. Uh, we urge all the parties to avoid rhetoric and to avoid taking actions uh, that could further exacerbate tensions. Uh, the sovereignty, the territorial integrity of all countries should be respected. Uh, Greece's sovereignty over these islands is not in question, but we call on uh, all countries, including uh, our allies, uh, to uh, respect uh, territorial integrity and, and sovereignty and to avoid actions that could uh, inflame tensions. We just, we just moments ago, we talked about uh, Ukraine and the provisions on the uh, arms provided to Ukraine. Now, I know that the, all defense articles of the United States are provided on certain provisions. Aren't there any provisions on those equipment provided to Greece in um, being used in violation of international agreements as Turkish government deems it? We are always taking a close look at the security assistance, uh, including potential uh, weapon systems and supplies that we're providing to allies and partners uh, around the world. We are in a fortunate position to have uh, a number of close security partners around the world, people, countries that look to the United States uh, as a supplier for the security that they need uh, to confront what are often uh, shared challenges and shared threats. Uh, oftentimes, this will come in the form uh, of terrorism threats and uh, other uh, um, collective uh, challenges. Uh, but there is a constant evaluative process when it comes to uh, looking at uh, the security assistance we provide uh, to any country around the world. Turkey and the S S four hundreds as well. When you talk about how it's up to each country to oversee or to determine the deployment of their own defense equipment. Of, of course it is, and there and, okay. and well then why and, are you telling the Turks constantly not to and, deploy and this, not to buy it? In the and first we have place, also then, made clear that there will be implications uh, given certain and, choices. And I think then the logical next question is if the, if the and we're talking about U.S. supplied military here in Greece, right? Are there not any implications? 
Uh, Matt, I don't think uh, our, uh, uh, this ally is uh, interested in purchasing the S-400 system in question here. This is the pr purchase of a particular uh, Russian <laughs> system that it's ran a afoul of, of, of congressionally mandated sanctions. Uh, so these are, these are different cases. Of course, countries around the world are open to make their own choices. Uh, there will be cases, extreme cases, where uh, certain choices will have implications on the part of the United States in our, in also, our bilateral relationship. Yeah, for example, F-16s, about, we talk about F-16s, and Congress is trying to bring some provisions that F-16s should not be used in kind of uh, a violation of um, Greek airspace, something like this. You, you, the question is, if, if provision applies to one partner and not the other, what is the standard? How should we trace uh, those those provisions and see that okay here is the standard the and standard, the, standard. The, the standard we use is what is in America's national interests and it just so happens that when it comes to our allies and partners what tends to be in our national interest is in the collective uh, is in the collective interest as well uh, yes. national interest of the let me States? let me move around so yes uh, Turkey uses its drone technology to spy illegally on the Greek islands and actually as a matter of fact they don't even try to hide it they release themselves the picture so my question is, what is your reaction to this incident? And second, is it unacceptable for a NATO ally to spy on another NATO ally? As I said in response to your colleague's question, we encourage countries around the world, particularly our NATO allies, particularly uh, as we are facing a collective threat uh, from the Russian Federation, not only what it's doing in Ukraine, but the threat it poses uh, to the broader region, uh, to remain focused, uh, to remain focused on uh, the threats that are a challenge to all of us. Uh, and in so doing, we encourage all of our NATO allies to work together to resolve any differences uh, through dialogue and diplomacy. Yes. Uh, thank you, Nan. I would like to go back to the energy crisis and the rising costs of um, gas and electricity. And I would like to ask you, what do you think about the uh, strategy Liz Truss has in the United Kingdom uh, where uh, she's doing these tax cuts that includes an energy package that is going to help families and businesses pay uh, their energy bills? Is this something that the U.S. is looking to copy? And is there going to be any global strategy for, you know, every country that they can implement then on a national level that can help offset the energy costs um, due to the war in Ukraine? This is a question for uh, the British people to decide uh, the sort of energy policy they want uh, in uh, their country. Uh, when it comes to the United States, what we have sought to do is to increase the resilience on the part of our partners and allies around the world. That includes in the UK, that includes uh, our allies in the EU and elsewhere. I've spoken already to some of the steps uh, we've taken. Uh, we, of course, are acting in concert uh, and uh, in some cases in coordination with uh, allies and partners in terms of um, tapping into strategic petroleum reserves, in terms of uh, moving supplies of LNG uh, where it's needed most. Uh, and then, of course, executing and uh, devising policies that will help lessen dependence over time on Russian energy, but also on fossil fuels more broadly as we transition to renewables. Yes. Uh, Seg segueing into a British person is a beautiful segue. <laughs> yes, uh, hello, Ned. Ned. Good afternoon. Um, uh, new topic. The security situation in Haiti has deteriorated over the past 12 months dramatically. American citizens are told not to go to Haiti, but at least 25,000 Haitians seeking asylum have been deported in the past 12 months. Does the State Department have any misgivings about deporting Haitians when their country is so dangerous? And then picking up on how you started the briefing with the Ukraine crisis, 100,000 Ukrainians have been given asylum in the United States, approximately. Haitians are seeing this and saying there's a double standard. What would you say to Haitians about that? Uh, so a couple points. Um, number one, we are and we have consistently partnered uh, with Haitian authorities to try to address the underlying security challenges that are at the root uh, of what you point to, uh, the violence, uh, the kidnappings, uh, the transnational crime, 
uh, that has plagued Haiti for far too long. Uh, we're in frequent touch with uh, the leadership of the government of Haiti, with the Haitian National Police as well, uh, including through embedded police advisors to evaluate and to address many of these most urgent security needs. Uh, for example, at the request of the Haitian National Police, we've provided 60 vehicles to address some of their mobility issues, uh, and we're working to provide more critical equipment as well. Uh, this summer, we committed an additional $48 million to support holistic anti-gang programming, uh, which includes specialized training and vetting of the Haitian National Police counter gang units, uh, community development, violence prevention programming, and partnership uh, with USAID and the OAS, uh, and uh, programming that begins to address other gaps, such as Haiti's um, ports in firearms trafficking. Uh, we have a bureau here at the department, a uh, bureau of um, uh, our INL Bureau. Uh, we also support counter-narcotics uh, efforts in Haiti, uh, crowd control, counter-gang programming, uh, community policing, corrections and border security units. Uh, all the while, we put an emphasis on human rights training and enhancing police transparency, knowing that that is a key component of our uh, assistance as well. There are another, uh, a, a number of examples of our collaboration with Haitian authorities, including the Haitian National Police. But the point is that uh, we are determined to work with them uh, to address these underlying security challenges, just as we continue to work uh, with Haiti and to encourage um, uh, a uh, uh, government uh, that is responsive uh, to the profound needs of its people. Returning 25,000, more than 25,000 Haitians, when you actually know the situation is dangerous, the State Department is comfortable with that? Uh, of, of course, we are not comfortable with the security situation in Haiti at the moment. Uh, it is a security situation that uh, is precarious. It has become increasingly precarious. Uh, that is why we become increasingly focused on working with Haitian authorities to do what we can as appropriate to help uh, address, to help them uh, address the security situation. Uh, we always uh, have an eye to security situations in countries around the world uh, when uh, we are in the position to have to deport nationals back to their home countries, and we'll continue uh, to work with our Haitian partners to address these longer-term challenges. Last question, your Haitian partners, does that mean that the U.S. supports Ariel Henry, the prime minister, as long as he takes back deportees? Uh, we support Haiti's constitutional process. Uh, we believe not in people, but in institutions. And in this case, Haiti has a constitution that uh, has stood the test of time that we think lays out an appropriate roadmap uh, for the next steps. So that's what we support. Uh, uh, yes, Shannon. So we've seen a checkered response so far from EU countries on whether to accept Russians fleeing conscription. Uh, will the U.S. support or encourage uh, its allied countries to hear these asylum claims? And of course, the White House has said that Russians are more than welcome to come and apply for asylum here. Uh, and they'll be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Just wondering if you could say if the administration views fleeing conscription alone as a legitimate grounds for an asylum claim. So on the last part of your question, DHS processes, uh, processes asylum claims, so that would be a question for them, not uh, for us. I think it's fair to say they look holistically uh, at each case, and uh, all relevant factors would be taken into consideration. Um, when it comes to our engagement with uh, countries in the region and potentially beyond, each country is going to have to make its own sovereign decision uh, about how to respond to Russians that are seeking refuge and safety uh, within their borders. That is not something that we are uh, going to prescribe. That is not something we would prescribe. Uh, what we have made clear uh, is the distinction we make and that a number of countries uh, have made around the world, the distinction between the Russian government and the Russian people. And I think the events of the past week or so uh, put a spotlight on that dynamic. In response to the actions of the Russian government, we have seen uh, an equal and opposite reaction on the part of the Russian people. Uh, and we have seen thousands of Russians 
take to the streets once again, just as they did in the earliest hours of President Putin's war against Ukraine, to make clear that they are not supportive of this war effort. They are not uh, endorsing the decision on the part of their leadership to potentially, dis to potentially send hundreds of thousands of additional Russians uh, to face injury or potentially death uh, inside of Ukraine. Uh, we think it's important for our part uh, to continue to have our doors open uh, to Russians who are in a position to come to this country. Uh, and we have seen over the course of this war potentially hundreds of thousands uh, of Russians uh, quite literally vote with their feet. Uh, Russians who have never had the genuine opportunity to have their voice heard at the ballot box are now in a position uh, to vote with their feet. In the aftermath of uh, the announcement of this partial mobilization, airfare sold out to the few places Russians are in a position to fly. Uh, we've seen border crossings with long lines of cars, individuals trying to get out of the United States, uh, and Russian nationals uh, around the world seeking to um, apply for asylum or other forms of safe haven uh, wherever it is they are. Uh, it's up to DHS to decide whether fleeing conscription is a is, is a legitimate ground for an asylum claim, but you're, you'll welcome them here, but it's up to DHS? As they process uh, asylum applications. Right, but do you take, does the administration as a whole, outside, do you take a position on whether that's a legitimate? Uh, Again, legitimate that, that, that that's a question for DHS yeah. because they adjudicate asylum claims. Okay, well, I just remember that back in the 60s and 70s, the U.S. administrations at the time took a very different position with Americans running to Canada to avoid uh, the draft then, and until they were pardoned en and, masse, they were still wanted criminals. Matt, that's a, uh, that's a right. uh, question for DHS. Uh, yes, in the back. Corporation. At the Pacific Islands Summit today, Secretary Blinken said that a declaration of partnership had been agreed upon. Can I just confirm, have all of the Pacific Island leaders here today agreed to that declaration? Specifically, has Solomon Islands agreed to that declaration? As is typically the case ahead of summits and ministerials, multilateral gatherings, uh, we are uh, engaged in uh, deep and constructive conversations with participants uh, in that gathering. This has been no exception. We've been uh, discussing our shared vision for the region, a vision that could be reflected uh, in anything that uh, could possibly emerge uh, tomorrow as a result uh, of the summit that President Biden is convening. We've made tremendous progress uh, when it comes to those conversations, and I'm confident uh, you will hear more and you will see more from President Biden tomorrow. Is it accurate to say, though, that that still hasn't been agreed to yet, that discussions are still underway? I will, uh, for now, uh, so as not to spoil some of the surprise for tomorrow, just say that we've been in a position to make tremendous progress. We've been gratified by the constructive conversations that we've had with uh, Pacific Island attendees, and we'll have more to say on this tomorrow. And how would you characterize Solomon Islands' concerns? It is not for me to characterize the concerns of another country. Uh, you're, you're welcome to ask them. They happen to be in the building. Uh, yes. Uh, President Lukashenko arrived today in occupied Abkhazia and met local leader. Uh, as Lukashenko mentioned, he wants, uh, and I quote, to build not only a breach of friendship, uh, very serious relations as well. I wonder if you could give me your reaction on that, please. Well, as you know, we remain in steadfast uh, in our support for Georgia and for its territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. Uh, we believe that Russia must be held accountable uh, for the commitments it made under the 2008 ceasefire. Uh, Russia must withdraw its forces to pre-conflict positions and reverse uh, its recognition of Georgia, Georgia's Abkhazia and South Ossetia region, regions. Uh, the Georgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs did, as you know, release a statement today condemning uh, the visit of Alexander Lukashenko, uh, condemned his visit to Abkhazia, and we'd refer you to the Georgian government for additional details. Uh, uh, is, uh, Simon? The Solomon sure. Islands. Like, could you just clarify in, in plain language? The secretary said he held up a document and said, we've agreed on this. Your, your answer just now suggests that that's not the case. No, I didn't mean to suggest that's not the case. I hasn't, just, it hasn't uh, been agreed. I, I was suggesting that you will hear more on this tomorrow. I think what the, what the uh, secretary said 
is that we've come to agreement on uh, the vision we share for the region, a vision that will be reflected uh, in everything that emanates uh, from this summit, including uh, any documents you may see tomorrow. That doesn't mean that all the countries have agreed to sign on to it. Uh, I, I think the Secretary was clear that we've been able to come to an agreement on a, on a shared vision, something we're, we're very gratified about. Uh, Abby? Uh, separate topic. Sure. I wanted to ask about a report out today from the Foley Foundation on uh, U.S. hostages and Americans being wrongfully detained abroad. Um, the report shows a dramatic increase in the number of incidents of U.S. nationals being wrongfully detained overseas. It's up almost 200 percent this de decade compared to last decade. And there's been a 60 percent increase in the average length of time that these hostages are being held, um, with over half being held for a decade or longer. Does the State Department agree that over the past decade, some of the, that the cases of U.S. hostages being held have become more difficult to resolve? And what do you attribute that to? And what is the Biden administration doing to ensure that countries are not taking Americans to be used um, as political leverage? So as you know, we often, uh, and, and as a general rule, we don't speak to uh, numbers, even in the aggregate, when it comes to American hostages uh, or wrongful detainees uh, around the world. I think what is true is that the broader uh, assessment that this report paints uh, is one that is reflective uh, of uh, the reality of the past decade, reflective of the scale and the scope uh, of the challenge that uh, not only the United States faces, but uh, that so many countries face when it comes to uh, the taking of hostages, when it comes to the holding of wrongful detainees uh, around the world. This has been a priority of ours since the earliest days uh, of this administration. We are uh, working with experts inside of government, outside of government, including, of course, with uh, the Foley Foundation uh, and other institutions uh, to defy, devise ways to uh, not only bring Americans home who are subject uh, to being held hostage or um, being held or being wrongfully detained, but also to deter countries uh, from this abhorrent practice going forward. We have uh, really two imperatives. Number one is to see to it that uh, the Americans uh, who are uh, have been kept from their families for far too long, in some cases years, are returned to their families and loved ones uh, as soon and as quickly uh, as we can possibly manage. But uh, number two, to uh, create uh, and ultimately to reinforce a norm against this type of despicable behavior on the part of uh, certain states. We want to make sure that every government who would engage uh, in this practice understand uh, that there are economic, there are financial, there are diplomatic consequences for uh, their actions. And we're starting to uh, do that. We are starting to raise the costs uh, on those countries who engage in this. Uh, we have worked very closely with our uh, Canadian allies. Uh, they have demonstrated leadership uh, in the fight uh, against this practice. Uh, the Declaration Against Arbitrary Detention and State-to-State -State Relations, as it's called, uh, now has nearly 70 endorsements, 68 endorsements from countries around the world. Uh, we've called on others to support this uh, as well. As you know, earlier this year, President Biden signed a new executive order directing uh, this department uh, and the interagency to recommend options to the White House to counter and to deter hostage taking and wrongful detentions. And we're working on uh, ways to do that, again, to make clear to countries around the world uh, that engage in this that there, will, uh, there would be and will be costs for their actions. Uh, we're also working on ways to educate and to protect uh, U.S. travelers, uh, including by publishing transparent and accurate travel information, including risk indicators, uh, on the relevant country's travel advisory page on our State Department website. Uh, two of our nine current risk indicators identify countries where kidnapping and hostage taking uh, of U.S. nationals and wrongful detention of U.S. nationals occur. As you know, the newest indicator we rolled out just a couple of months ago, uh, months ago the so-called D indicator, indicates um, uh, around the world those countries uh, where Americans may find, themself, uh, find themselves at risk uh, of 
wrongful detention. And we continue to explore options to further amplify uh, information to ensure that Americans, when they travel around the world, are aware of uh, these potential risks. Our hope is that over time, with careful planning uh, and uh, an eye towards developing a common approach with partners and allies around the world, uh, the cost-benefit analysis of countries that have engaged in this uh, will change, and that over time, uh, this will be a practice that is ultimately relegated uh, to the dustbin of history. Yes? Uh, to follow up on that, one of the findings in the Foley Foundation's report was that the families, many families say they're left in the dark when it comes to the State Department's process for determining whether their loved one is wrongfully detained or not. One person surveyed said they'd been left to wait nine months before knowing if their case would be handled by SPIHA. So my question is, can the State Department be doing more to speed up this process for identifying wrongful detainee cases? What we've learned over the years, uh, and uh, there are many people in this administration who worked in the Obama-Biden administration uh, who have firsthand, who had firsthand experience with this then, is that engagement with the families, early and frequent engagement with the families is one of the most important ingredients uh, to uh, the handling and to the ultimate successful resolution of a case of a U.S. hostage or uh, an American who may be wrongfully detained uh, around the world. We have, uh, both through the course of this executive order uh, and through a presidential policy directive that President Obama signed in 2015, I uh, devised uh, new authorities and means by which uh, the executive branch can engage with families, can share uh, with them, update on their loved ones, uh, updates that uh, can sometimes contain sensitive or uh, uh, classified or otherwise sensitive information. So our goal, of course, uh, is to always be as transparent and communicative and responsive uh, to these families uh, as possible. Now, there are always going to be limitations, but uh, no one knows better than we do that oftentimes uh, these cases can benefit from families and from engagement with families. After all, no one knows uh, the circumstances, the broader context, the unique considerations of any particular case better than family members and other loved ones. So uh, we always strive uh, to involve them uh, in the process. Uh, yes. Um, so, Polish uh, Foreign Minister Bao uh, said yesterday in an interview with NBC News that if uh, Russia uses nuclear weapons in Ukraine, the NATO's response should be um, conventional but devastating. Uh, is that something, I mean, is that an agreed approach? And uh, speaking of uh, Polish Foreign Ministers, uh, the former one, uh, Radek Sikorski, thanked the U.S. for this apparent uh, sabotage of Nord Stream. Um, and Senator Cruz um, asked today uh, Ambassador O'Brien in, in the Senate if the U.S. was, in fact, behind it. And he didn't get a you know, very clear answer. So can you clarify that? I'd be happy to clarify that. The idea that the United States was in any way uh, involved in the apparent sabotage of these pipelines is preposterous. Uh, it is nothing more than a function of Russian disinformation uh, and should be treated as such. Uh, when it comes to the contingency planning that we've engaged in for the potential use of uh, a nuclear weapon uh, by Russia in Ukraine, uh, we have uh, spoken very clearly of the implications uh, for Russia were that to happen. We've used a number of adjectives. Uh, we have said there would be uh, catastrophic, severe, strong, profound uh, implications uh, for Russia. Uh, all of those are accurate. Uh, we, are, we stand by all of those descriptors. Uh, the point that we have made both publicly and privately to the Russians is that the consequences would be real and they would be extraordinary. That does, that does imply a military strike. Uh, we're that's just not going to go okay. into specifics for, uh, for reasons I think you could understand. Uh, sure. A couple final questions. People are talking about two types of nuclear 
uh, usage of nuclear arms, tactical nuclear arms and strategic nuclear arms. When we say catastrophic response, do we mean about uh, strategic use of nuclear arms or will it be the same if you, Russians use tactical low yield nuclear missiles? The use of any nuclear weapons in this conflict uh, would carry those consequences. Uh, yes. This is on a completely different topic, Mexico and, co and U.S. COVID-19 uh, donate, vaccine donations. Mexico is the top recipient in Latin America of U.S. COVID uh, vaccine donations. Per State Department data, the U.S. has donated Mexico nearly 18 million doses of COVID vaccines. This past weekend, there was big news in Mexico because we learned that from those 18 million that the U.S. has donated, 3.5 million will be flushed down the toilet because Mexico didn't use them before there is priority date. Uh, the question here is, uh, did the U.S. make a wrong assessment of Mexico's, of Mexico's capacities to administer vaccines? Are you concerned that such a large number of vaccines donated to Mexico have been you know, wasted? Let's consider that Haiti only received one million doses. I would need to refer you to our Mexican partners to speak to their ability to have used uh, the vaccines that we've made available to them. Uh, what I can say is that we've recognized uh, in the broader context something we've really focused on uh, over the course of the past year or so is not only the challenge associated with vaccine donations, but also uh, vaccine distribution and also something we call the last mile challenge. Uh, it is uh, one thing to provide large scale shipments of vaccines, either bilaterally or through COVAX, as we have uh, to so many countries around the world, to hundreds of millions of doses uh, around the world. Uh, in some cases, uh, the challenge, in some cases, the, the biggest challenge is the challenge associated with actually putting those shots in arms. And so not only have we been in a position to provide uh, support in the term in terms of uh, vaccine dosage, uh, but we have worked with countries around the world, including last Friday uh, in New York City, uh, where countries came together to discuss uh, what we call our uh, GAP plan, our global action plan uh, on COVID. And one key element of that is the so-called last mile challenge, the distribution uh, challenge that comes with that. We're uh, very focused on it, uh, focused on it not in the context of any, uh, not only in the context of particular countries, but also working together uh, with countries around the world to address how we might uh, overcome just, these challenges. Just a clarification, just, uh, is the U.S. State Department looking at this issue or is just something that doesn't concern at all? The number is, is huge, 3.5 million more than what Peru got two million more than what Haiti got one million. It's it's a quite impressive number. It's not like you know small potatoes. Well, of course, we're concerned with the uh, global health and the public health situation uh, in our hemisphere. Certainly, uh, the situation in our own backyard. That's why we've worked uh, very closely with our Mexican partners over the course of the past 18 months to do what we can together. Uh, through vaccines, through uh, other mechanisms, uh, first to uh, stop uh, the spread of COVID, uh, and uh, second to build broader and greater resilience on the part of not only Mexico, but also countries in the region, knowing that this will not be the last outbreak, epidemic, or potentially even pandemic uh, that we face in this hemisphere. So uh, we started to focus too uh, on the next challenge, Alex. Uh, two questions. Let me go back to the sham referenda first. Uh, in your opening statement, you said we have seen this movie before and more pressure is coming in the coming days. Is there any reason why the administration has been in the wait and see mode in this particular case? You knew the actors involved. I'm just trying to figure out what is the taking. I, I wouldn't call our approach wait and see, uh, Alex. In fact, quite the opposite. As you know, we have been warning about this for months and months now. In some cases, our multiple warnings have engendered some frustration, including from some in this room asking why we're covering the same thing over and over again. Uh, and that's precisely because uh, we were and have been concerned that the Russians would go back to this playbook. You can say a lot about uh, the Russians uh, in terms of their, uh, you can say a lot about the Kremlin in terms of its brutality, in terms of its aggression. Uh, one thing it is not is perhaps all that creative uh, because they have used these very tactics uh, before. 
every aspect of this process based on our information uh, was pre-staged and orchestrated uh, by the Kremlin weeks, in some cases uh, months ago. Uh, we uh, have information indicating that officials plan to announce announce these predetermined outcomes. In some cases, they even set uh, the target uh, approval rates, the target uh, voter turnout rates. Uh, so we wanted to be very clear as early as we could, and our warnings on this started uh, shortly after uh, Russia's aggression began. Excellent. Shifting gears to South Caucasus, uh, yesterday National Security Advisor uh, met with senior uh, representatives of uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia mm -hmm. at the White House. Is there any reason why we did not see Ambassador Riker in the room? Uh, Ambassador Riker has been actively engaged with his Armenian and uh, Azeri counterparts. He was, uh, of course, up in New York City uh, last week with us, with the secretary. He took part in the trilateral meeting uh, he had, we had with uh, Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. He's recently been in the South Caucasus uh, meeting in person uh, with senior officials there. Uh, so he's been deeply engaged in this. Just to so clarify, yesterday's meeting was part of the sustainable process that you guys kicked uh, in New York, uh, or is it? Ye yesterday's, me yesterday's meeting, as I understand it, was a meeting between the national security advisors. Uh, we have engaged, uh, the secretary has engaged with his foreign minister counterparts. Uh, the secretary has also engaged at the leader level um, with uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, so we are engaging at multiple levels through multiple, multiple channels uh, to reinforce the need to uh, de-escalate and to d disengage. Thank you.